Good morning, party people, and welcome to scenic Cartagena, Cartagena, Colombia? I think it's Cartagena. Uh, we are, I'm on the midst of a 10 day cruise. Tomorrow uh, I hit the Panama Canal, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but getting ready to go out and venture out through uh, downtown or old town Cartagena, which kind of reminds me of like a European Cuba, like a European Havana with jungle all throughout it, like all the nice uh, accoutrements of the jungle that you associate, lots of palm trees, thick vegetation. It's really pretty. It's really a gorgeous old town. So first I'm going to go through some of your questions, and there are some great questions in the queue at Poll Gab. First up, Haydar asks, is there a way to suppress part of a query from showing, or part of a batch rather, from showing the query plan in Management Studio, but still have the rest of the batch show the query plan? That's a great question, and I didn't know the answer until, I don't know, a couple few years ago. Uh, and I forgot it until recently because I was, I was always running SP Blitz Cache and I would accidentally leave the query plans turned on. And then all of a sudden it would take forever for SP Blitz Cache to run. All these query plans are coming out through the, uh, through the results tab. What you want is set statistics XML off or on. Off suppresses query plans on enables them again. Now you probably don't just want to turn it on randomly inside your code because then people who are actually running it will get the query plans, which isn't a good idea. But you might check at the beginning of the batch to see if it's been turned on. And if it has been turned on, store that status in a variable so that after you turn off query plans, you can check to see whether or not you need to turn them back on for the rest of your uh, batch. Pretty neat little trick. I can't remember if I learned that from Kendra, uh, Kendra Little or Eric Darling, one of those two smart people. Next up, Mike says, Brent, simple blocking on a busy server can cause a failover? Yes. Is it because of the exhaustion of thread workers? Yes. Dude, you're, you're getting everything here. You don't even need me. He says, but I, underst I don't understand the mechanism. Ah. He says, can you please explain? I can but not from a cruise ship deck in Cartagena. <laughs> what you'll want to do is go to my mastering server tuning class, and in the mastering server tuning class, I actually demonstrate it. I uh, give you the queries to use, and I show you how a high CPU situation uh, combined with simple blocking can lead to things like SQL Server failovers. So that's my mastering server tuning class, the thread pool module. Next up, Grief says, Please describe the most strict and locked down environment you've worked with and the challenges it posted. Now I kind of get a laugh out of this because I'm going to reword it. Please tell me about the place where you're not allowed to talk about anything. Okay, so there are some vague examples that I can use. One of my all time favorites was I was told this is long before the pandemic. I was told that I absolutely had to be in a specific office, in a specific locked room in order to access the SQL Server. And I wasn't even allowed to touch the SQL Server. I had to describe the queries that I wanted to someone else who would sit at the keyboard and do their thing. So I get in there and uh, I, I understand I, I had to communicate with the customer look first It's gonna cost you a whole lot more time because it's gonna take me more time if I can't just say for example Run SP blitz on the server I'm gonna have to go through and I literally went through all the diagnostic queries that I had and started to describe them to the person and who had to then write them from scratch so the first thing that we looked at was weight stats, because I'm like, all right, is this server bored or not? What is it that's uh, the performance bottleneck on this particular server? And they go and they look and it's CPU. They can't get enough CPU power. And the DBA says, the weird part is, is it says it's bottlenecked on CPU, but at the box level, CPU is never really that high. And I said, show me what you mean. He opens up Task Manager and only some of the CPU cores were busy. The rest were sitting around idle. So I said, okay, let's take a look at uh, this DMOS schedulers. It's a DMV that'll show you how many CPU cores you have, uh, what the status of those cores is. And sure enough, what had happened was is they bought big giant 80 CPU core servers 
but they'd installed the version of, of uh, Enterprise Edition that's limited to accessing only 20 cores. So they had all this power, power just sitting around idle and they were only using one quarter of the CPU cores. And I said, well, there's your problem. You need to enable the rest of the cores on the server. And I described how to do it. And he said, is there a way we can do that online? I said, no, unfortunately, you have to do this uh, version upgrade or edition upgrade. You do it through the command line when you run setup. Uh, and you can change over to the right version or the right edition of uh, Enterprise. And uh, he's like, there's nothing we can do to fix it right now. And I said, no, it's you just you have to do this. And he's like, well, is there anything else we can look at? And I'm like, well, I can absolutely look at the most resource intensive queries. Do you have any control over the queries? No. And they said, that's why we bought 80 core servers. And I said, well, but, you know, my work here is done. And I was done in like an hour, which was kind of awesome. The fun part was we then got to go look at several other SQL servers. Uh, that was a big branch of the United States government, which was part of where the secrecy came from. And they all had that problem. They were all limited to only 20 CPU cores, which was uh, really funny. So that was my favorite. Next up. QEnt asks, Hi Brent, have you ever used buffer pool extensions as an option for better performance? No. They can't all be long answers. Have I ever seen them be successfully used for performance? Kind of. I have one client where I got involved and they swore that if they turned off buffer pool extensions, performance would get worse. I didn't believe that. But at the same time, buffer pool extensions wasn't causing them a problem. They were having a totally different issue on the server, so I focused on fixing that one issue. But in all my past, I have never seen it make any positive difference on a SQL server. I can imagine scenarios where it might, like if you had 16 gigs of RAM, and a terrible old enterprise-grade storage that was like USB, th USB thumb drive slow, uh, and where you could put local SSDs in the server, but that combination just doesn't make any sense in the year 2023. All right, next up, Hangman asks, when is SP Who is Active's context switches column a useful metric for performance troubleshooting? I don't even know what it measures. I have no idea. And what your question kind of reminds me of is it's kind of like somebody who waddles into an airplane cockpit, points at a dial, and asks the pilot, what does that dial do? Kiddo, if you're trying to learn how to fly a plane, stop pointing at individual dials and go to a training class which will teach you the big picture instead of randomly walking around it when would you look at this dial? Because it's just not an effective way to learn. I would say if you want to learn more about it, you can go, it's, it's open source, it's not exactly intuitive, it's a big complex query, but you could go through and find where the column context switches comes from, what DMV it comes from, and then you're probably better off if you want to ask questions on the internet or read the documentation as to what that column even measures. Next up, a friend of mine asks, says, Howdy, sir. Our CTO wants a monthly dashboard of all our production SQL servers. Can you please give some advice or tips on what KPIs I should include? For me, the big one is a recovery point objective. How much data you would lose at the worst point in the last month. What it really boils down to is, what was the biggest time span between any two successful backups on a server? So this is where SP Blitz backups comes in. I don't talk about it very often. I don't run it often during webcasts. What it does is it looks at the MSDB backup set tables, goes back to find the biggest time span in between any two successful backups, and that, if the server would have gone down one second earlier than the last backup completed, that would be how much data you would lose. Usually when I show that to people, they've never done any kind of analysis on that data before. And they're like, oh my God, we have an hour between successful backups on every Friday night. What's going on then? And we talk through it and improve their backup strategy. That would be the place that I would start. Uh, next up... Uh, Jester asks, 
What tool do you like to use in order to find the worst performing queries with implicit conversions? Jester, you're doing it backwards. Jester, you've learned how to fix implicit conversions, and we'll call that the hammer, let's say. And now you're looking for places that you can swing that hammer. You're doing it backwards. Instead of looking for places to swing your hammer, go look at the SQL Server and say, what are the top 10 most resource intensive queries? And what problems do those have? Otherwise, you could be just swinging your hand, hammer randomly around at queries that aren't even having performance problems. Focus on the 10 biggest performance problems first, and that is SP Blitz Cache. Uh, next up, Yakov asks a great question. What is the best way to print the line number currently executing inside a SQL stored procedure? It's a great question and I have no idea. It's never even occurred to me to ask it. Uh, I don't know how you would do it programmatically. Um, my, my first guess is to look at something like SysDM Sys exec requests to see which request is currently running and then parse that out of the stored procedure with like the statement starting character, but that's gonna require you running it at a different uh, session or else to do it in dynamic SQL. There's not like an easy, elegant way that I've ever seen. AM says, uh, I'm using where X in a list, like one, two, three, four, five, for selecting random sets of items. Oh, that's interesting. You're passing in a bunch of random numbers, generate random numbers on the client side, and then that way you could say where X is in that list. That's kind of nifty. Um, is there any performance reason not to do this and instead use parameters or put them into a temp table first? Is it right to assume that this won't be able to be a cached query? Yeah, you, you nailed it there. The, the performance problem with it is it's going to get recompiled every time. Not re, it's going to get compiled every time because SQL Server's never seen that particular set of parameters or set of literals before inside the WHERE clause. It's also going to bloat your plan cache because SQL Server is going to cache an execution plan for that with the hopes that it'll eventually see that one again. Um, so I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. I would probably use the temp table approach um, or a TVP, a table value parameter where you pass in a list of numbers there. And then we'll do one more. Oh, Mike. Mike, at, not that I know Mike, but I recognize this question. Mike says, since SQL Server 2005, a new version of SQL Server has been released every two to three years. What's your opinion on what the next version after 2022 will come out? Will it be 2024, 2025, later, or why? Microsoft development really got off to a rocky uh, time during the pandemic. So there was SQL Server 2019, then they announced 2022, but they announced it and then dropped it like right at the tail end of 2022. I would argue what they should have done was they should have called that SQL Server 2023 and shipped it a little earlier, like shipped it in November of 2022, but said, this is SQL Server 2023, so that that way it didn't look quite so outdated. But of course, what they're worried about is a long time span in between, a long perceived time span in between versions uh, because people will be less likely to continue paying for software assurance. Software assurance, among many other things, is the ability to upgrade whenever you want. Um, so if, if ver new versions aren't coming out, then people will be like, why am I still paying for software assurance? The thing was they shipped it in 2022 I would argue it's not ready. I know this is going to get me in trouble. But a couple of the premier features, a couple of the features that they were really proud about are still only in preview. For example, link to managed instances where you're supposed to be able to fail over between uh, SQL Server 2022 and Azure SQL DB managed instances. That is still in preview it's still in private preview. This is March of 2023. 
there have already been two cumulative updates to SQL Server 2022, and that feature still isn't ready. Beyond that, the other one was, uh, uh, what's the one that links out to Synapse Analytics? It's supposed to continuously feed data to Synapse Analytics. It's their new replacement for technologies like change data capture and change tracking. If you go look at the known list of limitations on that thing, it's terrifying. It's pages long. It has all kinds of showstopper bugs, and that's been out. That was out in preview for the longest time. I think that one's finally out in general availability. But I would argue that it's March 2023 and that product still is not ready. I know people don't want to hear that. So what do I think that that has in, in an implication for the next version of SQL Server? I think Microsoft's behind the eight ball here. They got some work to do. They've got a lot of fixing to do. And I think they got their work cut out for them before they can even call 2022 ready, let alone ship the next version. I don't know how they could keep adding major features onto this when the features that they released for 2022 still aren't even ready. And another place that you kind of saw that was in the tools team. SQL Server Management Studio 19 was required in order to support some of these new 2022 features. That was only in preview for months after 2022 released. The whole idea behind separating Management Studio into a different download from SQL Server itself was so that Management Studio could iterate more quickly and keep up with Azure. The tooling front end can't even keep up with the boxed product right now. So I think that the development story is a little bit of a hot mess here. I, I don't think that Microsoft should push it. I don't think that they should drop a new version in 2023. I think that if they drop a new version in 2024, there's a pretty good uh, chance that it's going to be just as half-baked as SQL Server 2022 was. Ren Ozar had to leave the country because he said bad things about SQL Server 2022. No, it's a coincidence. I'm not on the run from the law. So that sums up uh, today's office hours. I'll stop here and then go head out into beautiful Cartagena. The thing behind me is the kind of new Cartagena. This is more touristy or more uh, where the, the uh, uh, expats from different countries buy condos down here. Uh, but the prettier, older town area is where I'm headed, which is absolutely charming. So thanks for hanging out with me today, and I will see you all in the next office hours. Adios.